the reality is there's nothing in this for, me, for you apart from abuse. Oh, yeah, but I'm, I'm a corporate guy. I'm 30 years. I'm also highly ethical. If I see something wrong in science or in natural justice or a threat to the future of our democracy and freedoms, I have five children. So I always tell people I have two big drivers. The biggest driver is I have five children and I'm interested in their future and I'm focused on the next generation. I'm going to die. I'm going to get older and die. We all are. That's just life. Um, I'm focused on the next generation, mainly. So that's my big driver. And my second driver is truth and science. I have always fought for the technical truth to be known because since I was very young, it's hard to describe. I've got this glitch. I hate when the technical truth is misrepresented. I can't handle it when the technical truth is abused. That's my principle. So those two things together drive me. And I don't care what abuse I get. I just don't care. The reason is because I'm principled. And it's arrogant to say that, but that's the truth. myself and an Irish doctor sent a letter to the Taoiseach and it got it got referred to in the Oireachtas committee the Covid committee and it went all over the place you know what the response to that letter was and it was kind of what I'm saying here today but in 10 pages of actual data and showing how Sweden had done a fantastic job and how we needed to pull back from this the young the next generation the cancer diagnosis disproportionate actions we went through it all the reaction was in the following week a doubling down. Um, I never normally introduce my podcast. In fact, actually, what I kind of enjoy doing is just diving in and not saying when I've recorded. But this is the first time I'm kind of because um, the last time we spoke was we know now 18 or so months ago, and we spoke about a subject totally and utterly different to the one that we're about to enter into. And that is the one that is kind of totally consuming our daily lives at this moment in time, and that's COVID-19. And I suppose to put it into perspective, um, a, every single media outlet, every single newspaper you look at, every radio station that you hear, every website you go on is talking about a worldwide um, epidemic. And um, within that, we get a daily announcement of X number of cases and that, that, that there's a second wave coming and that this second wave is going to ravage us and that we need to lock down society. And then already the measures that we've taken within our own society now, we're, I think in Ireland, we're level three of a lockdown and you, that's wiping out industries and what I mean city centers or whatever you want to say I mean in terms of the damage that's been done and the the impact on our the liberties that we have taken totally but not really for granted the, the, they are getting wider and wider and bigger and bigger and the financial impact I've no idea really in terms of economically speaking what the impact of this is but what we are fed every single day is the hundreds and nearly a thousand cases every day. Now, that's the top line perspective. Ivor Cummins, you've come along with a, a different perspective on that top line case. And obviously we shut down the country back in March and then we slowly but surely kind of half opened it up, closed it down, opened it up. And still now we're in a position where we have nearly a thousand cases. And that really, really has an impact on in every, I've made my point, you have a kind of very clear and growing, you know, seems to be the growing interest in your perspective. Can you, can you just start with maybe giving me a few sentences on what that alternative perspective is on COVID-19? 
Right, uh, Frank. Well, the alternative perspective, I would say, is just a, a ruthlessly scientific, mathematical, logical, rational perspective. Uh, but I would say that. Uh, so essentially, back in March, there was a lot of uncertainty, and we saw the Italian um, pictures with hospitals overrun, et cetera, in northern Italy, and there was a lot of fear. So I kind of supported the lockdown at the time because I could understand it. So essentially, even though the pandemic guidelines forever uh, said no lockdown and quarantine for things like this, like a severe flu-like illness, uh, I could understand why they wanted to do it. One thing was they were copying China, which appeared to have done it successfully. Uh, and the other thing is the WHO began to support it. Now, their 2019 November guidelines, last published, did not support quarantining at all. But maybe they also were impressed by China. So I said, OK, they're going to do it. But you know what's going to happen? The viral mortality curve is going to follow its classic pattern. Right? That was pretty clear from the science and clear from the Chinese data and Italian data, follows the Gompertz curve in, in those regions. I, I'm going to have to get into that as well, about because most everybody wouldn't know. I wouldn't have known what those curves well, were. But sorry, keep going anyway. I can trace it. So basically, you get in a flu-like uh, disease epidemic, uh, not in all regions of the world, but in Northern Europe and North America, Northeast, you get a rapid rise, which we saw, and then you get a long tail off. And that's the Gompertz function is the closest function, but that's the way it's been forever. And uh, I pretty much knew that it's going to rise up rapidly. It's going to curl over is the term. And it's going to come back down. And by around May, it's going to be fading away. End of May, maybe there'll be no epidemic worthy of the name. And that's what happened. Uh, but I figured when this happens in April, they're going to just realize they can drop all the lockdowns steadily and quite rapidly. But uh, obviously the perspective on that curve going down, um, people will go, well, we stopped the curve because we locked down. No, that's uh, categorically untrue. Uh, we have five published papers now, probably more. I have a Dropbox link, which I can send to you. And uh, the mathematical analysis has been done on the lockdown timings versus the actual outcomes. And the answer is they have minimal effect. There is no real correlation around all the countries of the world between the lockdown severity and the outcome in terms of mortality. So that's kind of a scientific fact now. So, so, so you're saying that, that oh, the breakout had happened? Is that what you're saying, that the breakout had happened and then lockdown came afterwards. Is that, is that what you're saying? Uh, it came either afterwards or simultaneously or wherever it did. When you do the preponderance of data and analyze it all, there is no real relationship worthy of the name. So essentially, it didn't really have any significant effect on the actual what happened. So I give an example. In Sweden, it's clear from the data that when they took their actions and they chose not to lock down, well, around 23 days later, you'll affect the mortality curve. Because what you do now, by stopping infections, shall we say, in 23 days, you'll see an impact on the mortality from that. There's a lag, obviously. Uh, in Sweden, it was quite clear before that 23 days was up that their mortality was rising hugely. So their decision on what they did had no real relationship to the rising mortality curve versus the other Nordics. And there are papers published on this now. So essentially, the lockdown may have some effect, but largely speaking, the costs overwhelmingly outweigh any effect or benefits it will have. That's essentially the bottom line. And so when you describe um, that this is like a flu disease, as opposed to um, some rampaging virus that's going to kill us all. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, how can you say that? And uh, can you, in terms of the classification of it or whatever, can you, can you give me a bit more information on that? Yeah, okay. So SARS-CoV-2 is uh, a new addition to the coronavirus family. 
There are many coronaviruses. They've been well studied for many decades, and usually they call, cause a mild disease. Uh, though there have been very, very severe outbreaks with mortality in care homes with prior coronaviruses, where you had very big impacts. People don't seem to know that. But this one, in fairness, was very impactful or virulent. So it caused a much higher spike in mortality, et cetera, than the prior coronaviruses. So that's a fact. There was no denying SARS-CoV-2. Uh, but what really happened was that this coronavirus hit Europe at a time when we had had very soft prior flu seasons, like 2019 and 2020 right up to March. So this is a crucial point people need to understand that if you look at the all-cause mortality excess, which is tracked in Euromomo database, which we were looking at months ago, in 2018, you had 144,000 excess deaths in the winter respiratory season across 360 million people. So it sounds like a lot, but it's 0.04%. So 144,000 excess deaths, which happens every winter, this year, we have around 185,000. Now, because we know that lockdowns across Europe were too late, and we know mathematically they didn't really change the curves, that's quite clear, we can compare 2020 with 2018 quite fairly. So we have around 30 to 35% more excess mortality in the whole respiratory season. But what makes coronavirus quite special is not just its severity, but that it had its impact in a very short time frame. In around six weeks, we had this enormous spike, very tight in time, okay? And one of the reasons the spike was so severe was 2019 was a very soft season for excess mortality, and 2020, right up until around March, there was almost no excess mortality compared to normal years. So sadly, you had a lot of aged and comorbid and people very susceptible to these things were kind of built up, a very, very large group. Same in Sweden, same everywhere. Okay, so they, hit. what's that? And then Corona hit. And sadly, that, that caused quite an impact. So I'm gonna say that back to you in my, um, the way I understand it. And you can tell me then in, in, my, in the way I think about it, that essentially, um, and now we're talking about the hard facts of this, as opposed to top line case figures, what we're, we're, we're talking about the mortality rate. And what we're saying, what you're saying is that if you were to trend the mortality rate, the death rate over the last five years, that it might be a line, where's my camera here? It might be a line that goes like this, might go up 2017, might go up for 2018, down for 2019, and we've 2020, but we're talking about the average. So on average, for example, in Ireland, there's approximately 29,030 deaths, 30,000 deaths. That's, is that fair on a yearly basis around that figure? Yeah, I think that sounds around uh, right. Yeah, around 7,000 a month. Yeah, yeah, rough and tough. But anyway, we'll, we'll do the comparisons, yeah. Well, I did look at the CSO and I looked at that over the last few years just to see, okay, well, what's the average? What is just mortality? What is the death rates in Ireland? Is it, and it seemed to be between 28, 29, 30, that, that around that figure, I can't give you the exact because I didn't do it, didn't yeah. um, get my calculator out. But what you would expect then is that that 28,000 would take a jump, that there would be a significant jump to 32,000, you know, or sorry, uh, to 31 or whatever it is, that you'd see a 2K jump. And from, my understanding is so you have this trend line of death that goes up one year, down another. And when you say soft year, what you're describing is that that figure was, is down versus the previous year. So you're down by X percent. And then if, if COVID hadn't hit, there's the possibility that because of trends, now this is not a good way to look at it, but just that that trend would have gone up a little bit anyway. But what we're seeing, COVID hit, it hit hard, and that the most vulnerable that didn't pass away the previous year got hit by this. And the most vulnerable are people, were people in hospices and homes. That's, that's the vast majority. Is that, 
So am I saying that correctly in simple language? I mean, I know you've used simple language because I've been able to digest it, but essentially um, that, that because last year wasn't so as high or as, that this year has been hit harder because of that. And you've used the word like the, um, the Tinder, what is it you said? The... Oh, well, that was actually from a Swedish published scientific paper. They had originally used the term dry Tinder hypothesis uh, to describe this phenomenon because they saw it clearly in Sweden and then they saw it everywhere else as well. It's one of the primary reasons Sweden got hit harder than the other Nordics. You see in the media all about it was to do with their lockdown. It wasn't. This scientific team published 16 reasons why Sweden is higher impact and only one of them is lockdown and you can nearly dismiss that one. So the big one was what we're talking about. That's the big driver of Sweden's uh, kind of high impact. Yeah. I, so then, it, share, what's that? I could share some slides that will really help with this. No, I think there's no harm if you have ones that um, bring them up, because I suppose in essence, like this is, yeah. um, I obviously had COVID back in March and my wife had it and we were in the house for six weeks, we'd say between the, the getting it, recovering from it, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But I always, I, I always wondered what, if we had just been sick without all of the media, without of all of the lockdowns, would we have just got on with it? And, you know, the kids would have to go to school, we'd go and do the shopping, et cetera. We, you know, I don't have a perspective on that, but that's, but let's yeah. go to the data, yeah. I mean- I, I can answer your question, I think, uh, before we go to this. So I had it too, but it was, it was quite mild. I was tired for around a week afterwards. Uh, and I got the other phenomenon, the COVID toes, you know, itchy red toes, uh, which can happen afterwards because dead viral particles kind of pool where there's low circulation and cause a little bit of local inflammation. Um, but yeah, I think if there was no media coverage, it would certainly come up in the newspapers in March and April that there was a very severe late breaking flu was clearly causing a lot of mortality in the care homes and also pressure in the hospitals. And then by April, mid-April or late April, the news would have passed on uh, as it does. So I think that's what you would have actually seen. And we wouldn't have heard any news since at all. So that's if there was no media coverage. That's just the way it is. So um, here we have Irish Corona news. Can you see that, Jeff? Uh, it's, at the moment, it's white. There's nothing on it. Okay. Any okay. Up? Yeah. Okay. Can you see the gov.ie? Yeah. Okay. So I pulled this in April 22nd. We have in the news that, and this is typical of the cases who sadly passed, the median age was 87 this day. 33 out of the 44 had underlying serious health conditions. And the remainder of the 44 would have been overwhelmingly very aged. So that's just a reality. That was the nature of the Irish epidemic as it happened. But on the same day in the independent, I think, you had nursing home staff told, don't wear face masks unless there's a virus outbreak, by which stage it would be far too late for the inhabitants of the care home, obviously. So this kind of stuff was going on in Ireland and people might not remember it now. Uh, the other thing, and this is very important for Irish people to internalize. So this is from RTE, I think it was around end of May, yeah, 28th of May, and I tweeted this. Nearly 60% of the people who died in Ireland during the actual epidemic were never even hospitalized because of course they were in care homes. So they died in their beds, and maybe got some oxygen or whatever. And but, but just, sorry, what you're saying is they were, they were too sick to get to hospital? No. Is that, is that what you're saying? It's not, in fairness, and I'm not accusing anyone of any wrongdoing here. This is normal. If someone is very aged and moribund in a care home and they have a condition, respiratory condition, often it's the ethical thing to do to not actually put them through hospital and everything. And I'll clarify this point with ICU where it's even clearer. So just 80 people out of the 1600 who died had actually been admitted to intensive care 
In other words, around 95% of the people in, who died in our epidemic back in March, April, were never afforded intensive care to save them. And again, that's not because anyone was wrong or bad. It would have been an ethical decision by the doctors and the family that poor, you know, Joe or Mary is obviously so advanced in age uh, that it's not appropriate to be using invasive measures to save them because they're obviously so old or so late stage towards uh, death that independent of COVID, it's not appropriate to try to save them. So people need to internalize this, that all deaths, of course, are, are terrible. All life is important. But 95% were so already close to the door, if you will, that it was not appropriate to give them intensive care. And I'd say there's nearly no one in Ireland actually realizes what I just said. Because the media would give you the impression that, you know, it, was, it wasn't like this at all. So it's just an important thing to internalize and people should dwell who are listening and not let this brush by quickly. They should let it settle in and internalize it because the media never really would have told you this, you know, and, and do with it what you will. But if you look at Ireland's epidemic, here it was, it was over by the end of May, clearly. But back in the epidemic, here's the deaths per million hit up to 12 or 14 deaths per million people per day. Very significant. And remember the point I just said that 95% were too aged or moribund to even be given ICU. And let's look at that graph, that trend line, and let's just remove them. Again, all life is important, but let's remove, in fairness, people who are so aged or moribund that they wouldn't even get an ICU regardless of COVID. I think it's fair to do that. And... Here's Ireland's epidemic, if you do that. So around much less than one person per million per day in Ireland died from COVID once you exclude that group. And um, that's the epidemic. So, I mean, we got... Can I ask you on that, if you were to compare that to um, the flu season? Now, if you take out what you've taken out there and had that curve and the impact of uh, pneumonia or a bad flu and put that trend up there, how would that look? Well, a bad flu would be a very bad flu. Of course, the Spanish flu in 1918 would go way off the top of the screen up into the stratosphere compared to COVID, uh, probably maybe 50 times worse. But the bad flus of the last 20 years would be similar to this, but they'd be spread out over a wider few months because of what we said earlier, the soft seasons and the sudden rise of, of SARS-CoV-2. So they'd be similar impact, but spread out over a couple of months. So they wouldn't pressure the hospitals as much. Um, but likewise, the bad flu would look a bit like this. It'd be mostly aged or immunocompromised. However, it would also hit pregnant women and children. So if you're under 50, a bad flu is actually more risky um, and includes children and, and pregnant women will, will, will die often in a bad flu. With COVID, it's heavily stacked to the aged. So that's the only good, and I, I hate to say good thing about COVID, but it's all towards aged and morbid. Um, whereas a bad flu will hit the young as well. I mean, the Spanish flu took out a huge number of young people and people in their 20s, pregnant women, people in primal life. So that's the only good thing about COVID. It's all very elderly. So of the 1800 or so, it seems like the medium age now is of people that have passed. And I, I mean, like you say, I mean, just to, the medium age seems to be 84 and the, but the point of you know by discussing people who um passed it seems like a rather kind of cold uncaring thing to do but what we're what you're we're trying to do what i'm trying to do is put it in my own mind into perspective and i like to be if i'm going to be afraid of something i like to be absolutely clear of the present danger now i had it i was really unpleasant. I had all the symptoms. I'd lost the 
taste of smell, or, uh, you know, smell, breathlessness, all of the things. But I subsequently, I did, I got a full health check because, you know, I was starting to hear in the media, oh, people have had side effects. So then I started to be a bit paranoid at, at that. So I got a full once over and everything was reported to be fine. But so, you know, what we're, we're talking is here is how lethal something like this. The question that I posed there the last day to somebody was, was is COVID-19 as lethal to a mass population as, as we feared it was? That's the question for you. Uh, as, as the data suggested, when all the modeling was done at the very start back in March, is COVID-19 as lethal? And who is it lethal to? And who, who's, the, who's at risk? Who's not at risk, in your opinion? Okay, well, the lethality you can see here that in this less than one person per million per day dying in the peak of the actual epidemic, in there, when you've removed these guys, uh, you're still going to have overwhelmingly older ages and people who are, are immunocompromised who have very significant issues or late stage cancer. So if you remove those also and you only left healthy middle-aged people who are not diabetic, you're talking lightning strike type risk. So you're not far off lightning strike. I mean, maybe not quite, but that is certainly a, a journey in the car down to Cork is going to be more risk uh, for a healthy person in their 40s. You know, and this point has been made by top Professor Ionidas. The original infection fatality rate they thought it was was like around 3.6 or 4% the WHO is. The best figures are coming now that it's 0.12 or 0.13, right? So if you think about that, it might be like 30 times less dangerous than the original estimates in March. So Ferguson in Imperial College, who had a prediction of 500,000, maybe could die in the UK. The fact of the matter is, he was out by a factor of 10 to 12 times. And that's been proven by Sweden. In fact, they made their figures, would you believe it? The WHO back in March were using Chinese data. And Neil Ferguson of Imperial College, who came out with the shock predictions that caused us all to go insane, um, they used six people who were infected from 600 people on six flights out of Wuhan, China, as the basis for their predictive paper that they, that they published. And it wasn't even peer reviewed. Most science is peer reviewed, where other people and good scientists can say, hold on a minute, guys, you can't do that. Their paper was not peer reviewed. It went straight to the government and England went crazy with lockdowns. And then America, the IHME, did the same kind of calculations from the same base data and got the same crazy answers. So America uh, kind of flipped over. Uh, this, these are just facts. I mean, I've got the papers on my hard drive. So six, six people out of 600 on six flights out of Wuhan, China, is the basis for those modeling predictions. And they're out by a factor of 12. And, and so if you go back then to the previous slide, we have now, the reality is we have six months of information. So whatever, I mean, everybody, you can make your predictive analysis about anything and everything. Yeah. And now you have reality. So you well, have the, we, we have the reality of the situation. Well, let's look at some more reality. We talked about CSO figures. So Graham Neary here is an Irish person hold this data for me, um, which is great. Thanks, Graham. So here you can see- Can I just, can I just say, I, 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 I always feel it's really important because there's so much, people kind of can dismiss data immediately as, oh, but this is from the CSO. This is what this it's, is. This is for, and it's freely available. Anybody wants to go and do, make any effort to look for this information, you'll get, uh, you'll get, um, even some of the newspapers will give you a synopsis from uh, times gone by of different years, different seasons. And so this is freely available. Anybody can access this data. It looks like Graham has put it all together, a nice chart, but it's, 
it's easy to access this. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, you should read a book, How to Lie with Statistics, because the media are taking technically real data, but presenting it in such a way that it's got shock horror value. But like Graham, like myself and the scientists all over the world who have been uh, looking at this for six months, uh, we're pretty cold, hard data people. We don't do spin. And that's why our perspective sounds very different, because we don't do spin. So I'll show you here. So here's CSO 15, and we're talking nearly three people per thousand, right, uh, will die. Um, and this is the first five months of the year. So this is the perfect compare because April, March, April, May was the big impact period for COVID in 2020. So this is comparing to the other years, the same period. So here's 15, 16, similar, 17, a little lower. 18 a little higher and you'll often see this that when a year is low the next year is higher and it makes sense right you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure if there's a very soft respiratory season you're going to get a lot of people who do not pass as they might normally and there'll be more people next year when a normal year comes along and, and then you get maybe an extra uh, bump so that's okay but look at 19 19 and the period in 2020 up until March was surprisingly low. So this is, this is surprisingly low, same in Sweden. And let's look at 2020. So remember 2020 for the same period, we'd expect to be higher because A, COVID did all of its nasty work and B, it's taking advantage of a soft year beforehand. So we'd expect it to be higher. So let's have a look everyone wants to just lean in closer to the screen. <laughs> there it is. So that the, in, is that uh, January to September, January to May? May. It's January to May. Inclusive. Okay. January now, to if you include longer periods up till now, it's going to be lower again for the year to date because the Irish and mortality rates are the last few months particularly low. So yeah, it's, but for January to May, which is the harshest possible compare that should make 2020 look terrible, this is the data guys. And so this is the scream in question, that unfortunately, I know we touched off it, but what you, you have got, I'm sure all the time, the, the scream in question is, or people are saying to you, I, I'm guessing, they're saying, yeah, but we, we stopped that because of lockdown. That's, that's what you've got. I assume you're getting that all the time. Yeah, well, for those people, I'm sorry, guys, but you're being unscientific and you're saying an unscientific thing. So if you're a scientific thinker, uh, which I like to think I am, I go with the published analyses from experts. And there are many published analyses now that show that lockdown in Europe had a minimal effect. So there's no way you can remain scientific and make that statement that you just said, Frank. It's just a reality. It's just a reality. So there's only one study, one study done on the actual data since March that claims that lockdown did make a big difference. And guess who it was done by? Go on. Ferguson and the Imperial College team. But that's the only one. Now, what would they say? And I won't get into scientific detail, but they used a circular argument in the published paper that makes no sense. So two professors of mathematics in Germany published within a week a retort and said that that paper should not have been published because it makes no sense. So what can I say? I can only go with the published science. So there you are. That's a reality. Mm. You can show it by month. Here's the monthly showing the five months. And you can see that April 2020, of course, as we saw in the previous graphs, was, was quite severe. But it's not really more severe than January in 17 and 18. And if I took out the red color and I jumbled the years and the months, how could you pick out our COVID epidemic? You wouldn't be able to. 
is then if we move on and um i'm not arguing with that i want to kind of get to into the yeah. um I, I, you know i know you could say that on the trend but saying stuff like that and enable somebody else to go well if we haven't locked down that red would be twice as high and it, you know it's conjecture in a sense oh, whereas we're, we're looking data is not frightening when you look at it, all things considered given that we were trying to catch up on a virus that was plaguing apparently plaguing our country you can see that it, it's it's not beyond the it's it's not beyond the realms especially and, and more so when you look at the medium um age of people who died that's to me is the, yeah that, if that's what i come back to every time yeah, if you combine that with what we showed a minute ago, and this is just data. I mean, people who are scared of data shouldn't be commenting at all. And <laughs> who are commenting, I mean, to be quite honest, Ryan Tuberty um, and all the other media people, and this is no disrespect to them, but they haven't got a scientific bone in their body. In fairness, people who go into media tend to be the opposite type of innate talents to people like me who go into technical leadership and problem solving in corporates, you know, so all they're doing is parroting what they've been told. And, and say, I don't have a scientific bone in my body, but I'm sort of kind of just curious. And yeah. um, I like, well, I like the facts. I, I kind yeah. of, I, I, you know, I kind of like to know what the reality is. And yeah. so the primary, well, you know, and the reality, at this moment in time, we're now in September, and what we're seeing at the moment is a case, like, and I'm using your words now, but mm. case-demic. But yeah. in terms of people passing away, it's, it oh. seems like it's not killing too many people at the moment. Well, let's have a look. And uh, so... I'll just run to, it's probably best to show some slides for this. Um, oh, by the way, here's the snapshot of my Dropbox with all the papers that have analyzed the actual data from Europe, not modeling, actually analyzed the data of lockdown versus mortality um, and basically bear out what I said. Lockdown could work if you get in really early, but SARS-CoV-2, been demonstrated now in human sewage in Europe, in Italy, and a couple of countries, Spain, November 2019, it was circulating. Everyone knows that it's a high R virus that spreads like hell. We were all told that, and it's true, but it came in in November. In December, the first man died in the UK, has now been verified. So he got it in November, and there were no controls right up to March. So it spread as much as it wanted, okay? And you might say, well, why did the deaths only rise in March and April? And that's complex. It's to do with dormant or dormancy. And you know, the virome is complex. There are seasonal triggers. So we won't get into all of that, but that's just the reality. Um, people can work out themselves. Well, just on that though, yeah. I, and we, do, we won't need to get into it, but is it not a case that it 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 basically spread enough to the vulnerable and it did its damage it, like it is that not a possibility in what you're saying there that in the march time frame it was in society it was in if the first death was in the uk back in december that means it was making its way across europe and it was in the ski resorts where i was skiing in march that's where it happened well, that's where I believe, that's where I'm told. I mean, who knows? But what yeah. I'm, I'm trying to get a sense of, of that, of that, yeah. it suddenly explodes and then falls away. Yes, it explodes and falls away. But I guess I'm making the point that it's not like it suddenly started spreading in March and then we suddenly got deaths. It was spreading uncontrolled from much, much earlier. I give yeah. an example. Brazil has SARS-CoV-2 in human sewage samples November 2019 as well. You know when it started getting mortality rising up in the hump? Around April. And it's still going through May and June. So Brazil is the region where the virus triggers at a different time in the year. And this has been well documented for the last 
decades. No one talks about it. It's very seasonal and regional. So even though Brazil had the virus in the community in November, same as Europe, it has a completely different period where it triggers and you see mortality impacts. So I know this is a bit complicated, but just to let people know, there's much more to it than just spreading in ski resorts. That's the story, but it's a simple story. Yeah. Not necessarily for simple people. I'm not being abusive here, but it's a simple little story. But the reality is much more complex. So, Frank, you're going to like this one, I think, because this is for ordinary people. It's not too sciencey. Um, if someone close to me worked this out in April, and I knew that the person was not scientific, and they never really watch my stuff because it's too scientific and complex. So fine. But they said to me, this whole thing is off the wall, isn't it? And I said, well, what do you mean? I said, have you been watching my YouTubes? No, never watches my YouTubes. I said, <laughs> you know. And he said, well, a couple of things. I noticed that I like shopping and there's a lot of stores closed. So I'm going to all the stores now because that's my kind of addiction, uh, even though most of them are just supermarkets. And I've noticed that no one got sick and certainly no one died. And I've been asking even the older people who are working there, and I don't know anyone who knows anyone who died and we're in the middle of an epidemic. Um, so I said, yeah, that's good. So you've still got logic, even if you're not scientific. And I asked him, is there anything else? And um, he added a couple more pieces of logic. But see here, the supermarket workers in Ireland, this, this is a poll from May, they didn't have any extra infection or mortality, even when you correct for their age, than anyone else. But the supermarket workers, there were no masks back then, they were indoors, there was token distancing. But the reality is the great unwashed were flowing in and out eight hours a day. The supermarket workers were essentially not locked down. You cannot question that. They were essentially not locked down. But there was no signal of extra infection or mortality. And that was the same for the Grocery Workers Union in America, 4.3 million people. You know, in America, you got older people too who work in stores if you ever go there. And same thing, UK. So basically, you don't need to be a heavy scientific head or a mathematician to work this out. You can actually look just at logic like this. Yeah, and, and that's what I, I kind of really... You say it's complex. It, it is complex, but also it's simple. It should be simple. If if it isn't really the problem that I, 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 you know, then it should be simple. One question, and something like this is a real kind of simplistic uh, way to look at it and go, well, it didn't spread in mm. supermarkets. And I mean, I saw all the people in the supermarkets half wearing masks, walking around, and they're surrounded by the great unwashed, all of us coming in, picking, maybe we might have been doing slightly better, not mauling as much products, but we're still in the shops. And it, they didn't, yeah, that's very interesting. But it's and an I airborne aerosol virus, right? Indoors will be much worse. There were no masks back here. In the middle of our epidemic, remember, there were no masks. The mask came later when the epidemic was over which is an interesting question in its own right. Why would you bring in masks mandatory with prison sentences and fines? An epidemic has waned completely in the middle of the summer and you're many, many months away from a resurgence in the winter. That was an interesting decision that swept across Europe. So anyway, you could ask yourself that question. Why yeah, and it does. Um, I uh, there's a couple of things on that, but but we, let's come back to the masks um, later. Uh, what I what I wanted to ask you was in terms of, um, and this is where you get to the kind of hard data of it. But say we if we're sitting uh, and it's January 2020, and we look at the classification of death, right? And we'll see cancer, 9,000. I mean, this is if we're, 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 we're doing this quietly in a room somewhere and we're looking at the data and we're having a conversation. We say, 
approximately 29,000 died last year. Of that 9,000 was um, cancer. There was respiratory, eight and a half, 9,000. Then you had influenza, you have suicide, you have et cetera, et cetera, all our categories. And then we've COVID. Now, my, my data brain will look for the norms and I'll simply just look at the data and kind of go, right, has, has the cancer and the respiratory ones gone down a little bit or a good bit? And is COVID up the classification in terms of the, of the data? Who, and I'd kind of go, hmm, I'm not making less of it. I'm kind of going, right, well, is, is that, yeah, I, I'd want to double click then within the data and I'd want to find I want to find, I'd, I'd ask the question if I'm presenting or looking through the data, I'd ask of the COVID. And it seems to be the case that of those people that have passed away, that the data probably will reveal that their underlying conditions was maybe cancer, maybe was respiratory, but for this, it's been classified as COVID. Now, I'm a lay person, whatever. What do you think of what I've said there? Um, that's just the reality. So I have it from the inside and uh, it's in the data. So the 1650 a while back, even Leo Racker tweeted when the CSO, I think, came out and said it's probably more like 1100. And then another Irish body, I think it was HICWA, said it might have been 860 really in terms of excess mortality because we overcounted because it was anyone with a positive test who died, which is going to overcount. And um, then the figure is 104 people, I think, total who had no other uh, comorbidities or conditions. Now, you've got to be careful with that one because a lot of the people could have diabetes and that doesn't mean you should die from COVID. You know, every life is important, but still it's 104 with no other medical conditions. So you're talking overwhelmingly aged with an average age of 82, a median of 84, and overwhelmingly with comorbidities or serious conditions. It's just a fact. So yeah, I mean, if you do a pie chart of all the deaths in Ireland, we know already from what we showed from the CSO that it's no different in all cause mortality than prior years. And if you do a pie chart, COVID, true COVID is a tiny slice of the deaths. I mean, it's a tiny slice. You know, it's just the way it is. Now, people would have been died earlier than they would have otherwise. That's true. Uh, but the underlying medical conditions and age were a massive driver. I'll give an example. In August, just after they brought in mandatory masks in the summer, I always got to stop for a moment when I think about that because it's so unscientific. But anyway, um, in August, there were 400 and something suicides, I believe, higher than normal. And there was, oh, was it, oh, sorry, not 400, I think 41 or something like that, yeah. so 40. Uh, there was a huge number, I think it was a 700 cancers, or divide your, your 9,000 by 12, whatever, something like that. And then, of course, a huge amount of heart attacks and all the other stuff. And there were a handful of COVID deaths. And several of those, maybe most of them in August, were attributed to COVID, but they were not really. So that's all during August, July, August, September. We were all doing all this stuff and talking about this when the reality was the COVID deaths were a tiny, tiny fraction of the real deaths in Ireland. I mean, I don't know, I have to pinch myself still. I had to live through those months. So did you. So I put up something there recently because there's this journalist who's just putting the top line. He's just echoing the top line data. And I put up something like, because I think the CSO data is up to now September 18th, which is pretty, mm. maybe it's more up to date than that since, but September 18th. And within that, it says the medium age is 84. And I was kind of going, medium age is 84. Could, could we talk about the underlying conditions? And the comment, one comment was, Oh, I said, can we have a different conversation? And somebody said, yeah, like uh, throw your grandparents under the bus. So no. Um, I, <laughs> I don't know what to say to people like that because they're so 
profoundly unscientific and illogical that I'm not sure it's worth having a conversation mm. because what on earth has discussing facts, data, and reality, which is very important, by the way, it's very important we use context and proportionality to get the maximum overall health and well-being of our society. And to mm. do that, you have to talk about the actual data. But if someone accuses you of wanting to kill a granny because you're actually doing the ethically 100% right thing to do, as in look of the whole of society health and how to optimize that best. And someone accuses you of that. They're clearly profoundly unscientific and shouldn't be allowed anywhere near, uh, I don't know, media or where they can say things like that. Well, uh, that, I mean, that's the that's Twitter, isn't it really? I mean, you know, or whatever you, there's nothing. Yeah. That, I mean, you have to but, accept, you have but, to accept that. But I, I mean, I said in media too, though, I, I agree. Twitter people can say anything and I fully support that right for people to say anything they want. I think that's hugely important in a free society. But in our mass media too, we have seen sentiments like that, that are profoundly unscientific and in my mind, unethical to try and stamp down the proper conversation uh, by saying things like that. You know, it's actually quite sinister in some ways. Well, it is because it's what, what you, you have to kind of go, no, I, uh, I actually um, like grandparents. I, I, I love them and I really wouldn't want anything bad to happen to them. And in fact, you know, if I really knew, if I'm so clear that they're the ones that vulner are vulnerable, then that's, you know, it's really good to know that, you know? Yeah, and, absolutely. Um, I, I, absolutely. But, that's the, but that is the way I, I am. I just kind of like to know the information. And then, but there seems to be a sort of, unwillingness to want to have this because you see we're having a conversation and we're talking about deaths so there obviously who wants to talk about death really people don't want to talk about the reality of this and you know good we can't save people from you can't save people from old people older people from dying but you can protect vulnerable people from dying too soon you can you can you can do that and uh, it's just that conversation, though, is just what the, here's the reality of this shutting down an entire country. For I mean, if I, you know, shutting down an entire country now, OK, we've done what we've done back in March and April, and I wouldn't argue with that necessarily. You could argue with it. You could argue with it, but it's absolutely pointless. All you can do is deal with the situation that we're in right now, which is we have six months of data. And the, the, that suggests that the vast majority of people will be absolutely fine. And for those that are vulnerable, well, they're vulnerable. They need, they, they need to be take care. Yeah, but that's too logical. <laughs> you see, that would have applied for all of history and for any other disease. But COVID has turned science upside down and all the normal rules upside down. So of course, if we can lock down a whole society and prevent spread, isn't it obvious we could much easier protect the small percentage who are most at risk? If we can stop spread of the whole society, we could certainly much easier stop spread in a small group. But no one wants to acknowledge that. Oh, we can't protect them. We have to stop it spreading for everyone. I, I like it. If I'm 75, right? I'm sitting at home and I'm listening to this conversation here. I kind of want to know now, right? Well, am I, what are my risks now? If I'm actually very healthy, I, I'm out walking most days. I'm, I live up until COVID. I've lived a really good, healthy life. I had no heart problems, no issues. And I, you know, I do yoga in my seventies and I'm in pretty good form. I want to know my risks. I want to know, why I can't see my grandkids. I want to know why I can't get out and about and go places that I've gone to, because at the moment, my life has been totally destroyed. Now mind if I'm 45, and, but I kind of still just, I want to know, I want to know the facts. Yeah. I want to know what I should be afraid of. What, what are my risks? So um, the first point is, if, if we did go ahead with a rational plan uh, to protect the at risk, it should be voluntary for them because unless our hospitals are totally overwhelmed, we should not be forcing people 
against their will to protect them. That happens in fascist states. It shouldn't happen in a modern free democracy. So they should be strongly advised how they can best protect themselves. And we need to afford them whatever they need. You know, send them groceries, send people to visit in a safe manner. We could do a huge amount for the older and exposed people, um, but we should not force them to be isolated because they have a choice when they drive a car or cycle a bicycle fast. We all have the autonomy and choice to take a risk. So that's one thing I'd say. And the risk now to older people, my mother has turned 80 and I told her, based on my research in March, that I wouldn't worry if I were her. And the reason that I said that was, I'd much prefer to be you with SARS-CoV-2 than a 53-year-old type 2 diabetic, very overweight person. Because the reason the aged are at more risk is because they become metabolically very unhealthy and their immune system becomes less effective. And that's just the way it is. Uh, but if you're a very healthy 80-year-old with excellent blood metrics, like my mother, um, your risk actually is not the normal risk of an 80-year-old. It's far lower. And we knew from the Chinese data back in February, 10 times the risk for diabetes, 10 times the risk for you know, heart conditions, which a lot of which are diabetes, uh, just undiagnosed, et cetera, et cetera, and for age. So we knew who was at risk. We knew back in February who was at risk, and in Italy as well, aged, COPD. We knew who was at risk, but we didn't tell them and protect them. We could have put them up in five-star hotels with PPE equipment, you know, uh, staff coming in. We, we could have, for a thousand of the cost of the lockdowns, we could have put them in five-star hotels with full reams of staff looking after them. Theoretically, you could, you, you could actually do a phenomenal amount right now, even for of course you could. Yeah. even better. The people at risk would even feel more special than they normally would, because society for a hundredth of the price of what we're doing could make them very special, you know? Yeah. And but we but no one's considering any of this, Frank. Except you I see, I just think the conversation just just people everywhere. I think the conversation is starting, and in thanks to you, really a lot. The com people are starting to have this sort of conversation. Going, is it absolutely the right thing? And I kind of want to try a different. I, I'm trying to figure out any. There's no bias, or you know, I, I don't want to be missing something in, in, in my thinking or my questions that I'm asking you. I, I want to know, you know, if somebody says to me, well, now the season's coming again. I mean, I feel the most of the amount of fear or a lot of the fear is based on the Spanish flu and the fact that the second wave was so bad that people kind of, that's the one big example that people have. So there, there's this fear of the second wave can, that it's going to ravage. What, yeah. do you, what do you think about that fear? Uh, that's unfortunately false and unscientific also. I mean, I hate to say it, but I've been saying this for months. The Spanish flu 1918 was not just a viral issue. It was very complex around the time of World War I. There was malnutrition involved, etc. And there were three waves. And it's kind of a once in hundreds of years phenomenon. And there's no way it was going to be repeated with a coronavirus. So the impact was vastly higher than even our epidemic wave, you know, in March, April. And the second wave occurred out of season. And generally there's a consensus because no one has any data for it. There's a consensus that because it hit a completely different demographic and it hit young people and not the old, that it was probably an 1870s influenza strain that came back, so the old were protected. But in other words, the data that they have, the second wave is actually a different phenomenon than the first, a different pathogen. So because it's 100 years ago, they don't have the biological actual samples or data. And the evidence suggests it was a different pathogen that hit or possibly major mutation because influenzas can mutate. Coronaviruses don't really much at all. To compare anything now to the 
1918 flu is a wrong thing to do. It's absurd. It's like saying 2018, we had a bad flu and in England there were hospitals overrun. 2018, a lot of excess mortality. But imagine saying then, oh, we could get a second wave of this bad flu at the end of 2018, like 1918. If you said that, people would think you were a crackpot. Mm -hmm. So it should not be, it should not be compared uh, to, to, to 1918. Um, so what we should expect is a resurgence in the autumn and winter of the viruses, including SARS-CoV-2, um, but not like the actual epidemic. It's going to be smaller, more like a normal winter. That's what you would expect scientifically. Guess what? That's exactly what we're seeing. See, back in back in um, March, back in the mid March, towards the end of maybe start of April, when I, I was I had this, like I said, and I I started to see some videos about I saw these two doctors in California and they were very matter of fact but I, I was kind of suspicious don't ask me and that was removed from YouTube which kind of irked me at the same time but because I was sick you know I mean to be fair it's pretty vulnerable so I'm seeing the mass media I'm it's reinforced by how I'm feeling so then when I see something contrary to it I kind of go well you're not looking at the data you're not this is where I was back in um march april time frame and then i mean there was the likes of elon musk came out and goes well the data is pretty clear now you know we can see what the risks of this are but i, I was still looking at case numbers at the time to just pure case numbers to death and i was kind of going well that's a five percenter there that's pretty high now i know that the reality was though that I wasn't tested. So I have no piece of paper to say that Frank, I, you know, that I had it, but I, every single symptom, but still, so I'm not included. So then my brain kind of, kind of went to, okay, well, if mine is not included, how many more are like me or not? And how accurate is that given they've only started testing? How accurate is that 5%? Because it did look like a, a 5%, which is pretty big, but that wasn't accurate. Oh, really? uh, those, if you, if you brought, we see now a rise in cases the last few months, the case demic, I call it, but we're doing 20 times the testing numbers that we were doing in April. Yeah, put that in perspective. When you give times. me that in thousands, what's what's when you say 20 times? Oh, so back in well, March when we were quoting that figure. In, on a day in April near the start, I think we had, was it 390 tests in a day? Could be wrong here. That's from memory. And we hit like 19,000, I think, or at least 16,000 the other day in a day. So we're compared to early August, we're four times the amount of testing. And compared to the very start in early April, in the middle of the heat, we're around 20 times the testing. We're off on top. But so that's really, 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 that's a really crucial point. You know, if you were looking at the data at the start, you'd say, 100 cases, um, five deaths. And you'd kind of go, right, that's... But the reality is of the testing. And that's what... That, that's, that was the gap. I mean, they weren't... That, they simply weren't testing everybody. And that's... Of, so that 5% was not correct. And in actual fact, it's probably that 5% divided by 20, if you're saying it's 20 times it, you yeah. know, or even but, more. And that's... But, but Frank... That, that's so elementary and intuitive to me, but yes, the media and the vast majority in the population will not know that. But of course, it's obvious. We were only seeing a tiny, tiny fraction of the actual infections back in April. Tiny. So if you show the graph now of the cases rising uh, up as we go from August to September, in the case demic, if you will, well, if you truly were doing the same amount of testing and proper testing back in April, the number of cases would be so high, it would go way off the top of the chart. You'd need around five more pages. 
So we never, you never see the reality in an epidemic because your testing is only getting going. You see a tiny fraction of the people who are actually affected. Um, but now it goes the opposite. You do hyper testing and you see tons of stuff that actually doesn't mean much. So a large amount of the positives we're seeing now with all of our massive testing campaigns, a large amount are false positives, which is just the nature of the test. Another bunch, the test only looks for viral fragments, tiny proteins from SARS-CoV-2. So you're going to get a whole load of people who have some fragments because they had the disease six weeks ago and now they're fine. But you're going to pick them up with a positive test, but they don't mean anything. And then another bunch of people might have a very mild level, but because the test multiplies up so much, a person who's not transmissible and really is irrelevant will get a positive test. So a small fraction of the positives we're seeing are actually infectious symptomatic people who matter. But that's only a small number of the cases that we're seeing. So the authority should be getting that number and you can use science to find out that number and tracking that and throwing away all the chaff. But they're mm. not. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, this is the conversation. I think it's going to start. Yeah. I mean, it seems to be um, there's an appetite. Well, we'll see. But um, I mean, we could go down the... Um, You see, I, I think the most provocative thing about all of this, the most real thing about all this, we could go down a rabbit hole about face masks. I mean, I never liked the idea of face masks. And but I mean, the reality is I could feel it happening back in the summer. And there was already the energy of people looking at you if you weren't wearing the face masks until it became. And it's almost a thing of, well, you're feeling like you're doing something. It's psychological, really. So the thing, you can argue about face mask efficacy. And I always say, look, I tend to go with four decades of published science on face mask effectiveness for viral transmission, rather than four weeks of rush science in June 2020, which was weak and indicated they might help. It's just the way I am. I'm, I'm a person of science. I've spent my whole career upholding science. And and bad science kind of offends me. So it's just the way I am. I'm like that. But the real question on masks is what I mentioned earlier, and which stunned me. I had two days I was bumping into walls in July when they brought in mandatory masks. Not because of the lack of science supporting it, like Anders Tegnell and the Swedish epidemiology team, who are world beaters, they have done an incredible job. They don't allow masks based on the science being too weak, it's not appropriate. So I'm, I've got lots of people who agree with me, but let's forget about the effect of this and say, look, they're easy to do, why not? Well, my problem is, why would you bring in obligatory face masks in the middle of the summer after an epidemic has clearly, utterly waned? Why would you bring them in? Why wouldn't you bring them in in March 2020 or in December 2020 if we have a major issue? Because if you bring in mandatory masks in the middle of the summer, that makes no sense whatsoever. How would you ever take them out? In other words, some people made a decision to bring in a permanent change to mask humanity in Europe. That's a big decision, you know? I consider that a big decision to mask people in perpetuity. Because if you bring them in in the summer when nothing's happening, there is no exit strategy. Mm. And, and you I see, you see what, what, what they did, sorry, was, did I cut across you there? No, go ahead, yeah, yeah, that's it. No, no, you see, the, I, I believe there is this idea that because of the actions taken, they got this under control. That's what, that's what the belief system is. The rigid belief system is that they took action to get this under control, even though it didn't involve 
mandatory face masks, but they got it under control. And then it was the case of, okay, well now let's keep it under control and bring in these measures because we've done this great thing and now we can keep it going. That's, and, and it seems to be that there's an invested interest now in the belief system that the lockdown worked and the belief system that all of these actions that we are taking is keeping this virus under control, despite the fact that the cases are rising. Yeah, well, I'd say that the belief system in the lockdown, given that these people never studied the data to verify if their intervention had an effect, they never even chose to study it. Such a huge intervention that caused such costs to missed cancer diagnoses, economic disaster. They never even went back to check if it was true, if it did something. Can you imagine they never did that? But the five or six teams who did found that it didn't really do much. Okay, so we know that. So that belief system is profoundly unscientific. And then to bring in the masks on the back of that unscientific belief system, when even if the lockdown had done something, even if it had, to bring in permanent mandatory masks in the summer when everything, you'd pulled out your lockdowns and everything was clearly okay, hospitals empty, to bring in mandatory masks then, even if the lockdown had done something, is doubly unscientific there is no escaping this frank i I know years in complex problem solving leading teams in every aspect of science i'm agreed with by so many top professors including the swedish team and many more it makes no scientific sense to bring in mandatory masks even if they are oh they do help for influenza like disease transmission even if you say, yeah, they do. Let's just say they do. There's no exit strategy. And that to me is the kind of striking, say, in my mind, real leadership is the, the ability to be clearly be able to say, okay, well, we took this course of action. It seemed like absolutely the right thing to do. Now we have six months of data and we, we feel we can take a slightly different course of action because there's so much investment in the decision that there doesn't seem to be the ability to be able to lead like that, to use that language to say, well, yeah, I think we are probably over the hump of this now. And we're going to take a different course of action from here on in, which involves this personal responsibility, protected focus protection or whatever it is. My worry is that there doesn't seem to be that, that there doesn't seem to be that personality or that leadership there to go. Yeah. No, I think we need to, to be, stop now. To be honest, Frank, I, I knew it was a very dark day for me in, Ju- in June, July, when that mask thing came in, because then I realized that the long age of science had kind of ended for us. And I was very sad because, you know, as I say, I'm a, I'm a man of science. And I realized also that if they can do that inexplicably, God knows what's down the road. Well, I mean, we won't, I know, we won't, we won't go there simply because anything is down the road. But what I'm yeah. saying, they, 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 what's more worrying is one is the people, is the guidance to do it. And then actually, though, if you just look across the social media with people with their pictures of wearing a mask, the, the anger and rage with which people want to stand by a, an opinion is is, uh, is more worrying and that's another rabbit hole but that to me is is the ability for people able to live in fear as opposed to going well okay well what exactly am i afraid of here yeah. and, and but it's not like you say you say you're a scientist but the reality is this doesn't require any science this doesn't require any huge amount of intelligence to look at the data and go okay it's the, the vulnerable right we need to protect them End of story. Um, yeah. But we have always needed to protect the vulnerable. I mean, if, you're, if your nipper has a flu, you're not bringing your nipper to see the grandparents. If your nipper is, you know, really, really sick, you don't, why would you bring them to see the grandparents when they pass it on to the grandparents? That's always been there, that common sense. It's just fucking, we're talking common sense here. Common sense. Everything went out the window in April 2020 common sense and all the scientific aspects I mentioned. And 
there's a self-reinforcing loop now that's spinning in circles and they've painted themselves into a corner like I've never seen in my lifetime. And I gave the example of the tiger horn deceit to explain some of the problem we're seeing. Mm -hmm. It's basically that the tigers attack the village and kill villagers and there's a panic. And then when the tigers are subsiding away and moving on, the chief brings out magic horns that everyone blows and they blow them. The tigers seem to go away. But then people start saying, maybe the tigers were going away anyway. And you shut those people up, like you take them off YouTube, right? Um, because now you're invested in the horn. And the problem is you need to keep blowing the horn. Because if you stop blowing it and the tigers don't really come back, then people will start asking more questions. And that, but that's, that's exactly what's happening. The decision to not to go to level five, we'll say. People are going, now nah, you're a disgrace for not going to level five because look, they, look at the case numbers. I they, mean, they, and so it is reinforcing. You're absolutely right, yeah. They, they have opened a Pandora's box of the human psyche and the innate fear of contagion. So they basically, it was published by Sage in the UK and other bodies, and they have this published in a report to use the mass media to instill fear, to use social media, to get people to kind of shame other people who are not following guidelines. They planned all of that. And let's give them some credit and say, they planned it because they really felt we needed to get the measures followed. But the problem is when you do that is you open a Pandora's box and that's what we're seeing, an almost psychosis now in the public. The terrible thing that Ireland did, even more than other countries, the last few months there has been endless propaganda all during the summer instilling more fear and fomenting fear and terror. And humans have an innate fear, like of spiders in some cases, you know, rightly. And they also have an innate fear of disease and a contagion, uh, an irrational fear. So what they've done is they've stoked that up and they've ripped open Pandora's box. So now you have the people demanding the government them down more, which is completely psychotic. That's yeah, well, you see, but then um, my take on that is that really sometimes, you know, when you're a kid, the first fear was there's a boogeyman under the bed and you just need to look under the bed to see there isn't a fucking boogeyman there. I mean, but you can remain afraid or you can look under the bed and go, OK, mm -hmm. looks pretty OK. I, 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 you know, I, I was really worried. I was really afraid, but I was wrong. And um, I think... Yeah, I mean, I, I, st I think that the only thing that can happen is the reasonable conversation. And I think then people will, oh, it may, it may, it's either going to get worse and worse and worse, or just the general idea of this, that it may start to ferment that people go, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know if I should be as afraid. Oh. I, I think, Frank, there's green shoots. I mean, I've been in the British Telegraph. Um, I've been on uh, talk radio several times in the UK now. A lot of pieces on, on big, big uh, re listenership um, radio. And, uh, you know, various other places. But I, the Irish, no. So the Irish media is uniquely bizarre in the last few months. Uh, almost to the point I, I've been calling... <laughs> Pravda. I mean, I just can't believe what I'm seeing in the media. It's it beggars belief. But there are green shoots now. The Telegraph, the Spectator, covers actual scientists who are coming out with, with common sense. And one thing, actually, for anyone listening, uh, gbdeclaration.org, uh, the Great Washington yeah. Declaration, you just look at that website, it's half a million signatures from scientists, doctors, and lay people. And you've got the top professor in mathematical epidemiology, Professor Sanetra Gupta, a lovely woman, incredibly intelligent. And you've got professors from Stanford and, uh, and um, oh, Harvard as well. And they've come together and there's a long list of professors on the page. 
who are saying exactly what I'm saying. Have you seen how they dismissed that, by the way? No. Have you seen? They dismissed how... that, that. That was propaganda. Yeah. What they've done is they've they've ignored the vast, vast amount of professors. Yeah. And scientists. They've ignored that, and what they've done brilliantly, and I, I, this is what I don't understand: is why would you you'd ignore the vast amount of people who signed it? And what they say is basically because anybody can go onto that website and sign it. They they will say basically they said. Professor Nobody, they're actually the Professor Quacky um, has signed this amongst all the other ones. And so in a heartbeat, the, the headline of these mass media is, is just to dismiss it. Uh, that is did you notice pure, that back? Yeah. pure distilled propaganda. I have no problem saying that because that's what it is. Because any um, kind of website like that that brings in hundreds of thousands of signatories, of course you're gonna get people who don't agree with it, who will go to it and put a stupid name to discredit it. Yeah, that's so, exactly what they did, yes. Credit it, yeah. I mean, the very person who does an article saying that Dr. Nobody is on it, that person could have themselves gone on and put Dr. Nobody and immediately done an article saying, look, Dr. Nobody's on it. Yeah. It's so stupid, but, there's a vast overwhelming majority there are genuine. And we have 25 Irish doctors now are signing a letter, pretty much saying what I'm saying, and it's gonna to go to the tea shop. We have groups of doctors, Belgium, Germany, uh, all over the world and Canada as well, who are literally pulling their hair out at this propaganda we've had for six months. The, I mean, the, the way out of it, the way out for these guys, I, I like to, you know, in, from my days in business, you like to kind of present people with their with their ticket out of the shit that they've dug. I mean, one way, one simple way out of it is to, is to say, they can start by saying, and nobody has to look bad, but they can start by saying, it may not be as lethal as we once feared. It seems like we could be over the worst. We don't know yet. And they can keep it going a, a little while, as long as they need to but if they start that at least they can you know they can get out of this because doubling down on this is the what you've kind of suggested that's the worry for me as well is the doubling down on all of this the reinforcement the lockdown all of this because they're so far into the lie now not the lie that's too much now but they're yes. so far into it but one easy way right now is to go we're looking at the data and some we're getting new data all the time, but the data does suggest that there we're over the hump of this. I I'd love to usually that's the case, but um, in August myself and an Irish doctor sent a letter to the tea shop and it got it got referred to in the Oroctus committee, the COVID committee, and it went all over the place. You know what the response to that letter was? And it was kind of what I'm saying here today, but in 10 pages of actual data and showing how Sweden had done a fantastic job and how we needed to pull back from this, the young, the next generation, the cancer diagnosis, disproportionate actions. We went through it all. The reaction was in the following week, a doubling down. So this doubling down mentality is extraordinary and it's unprecedented in the history of science and democracy uh, i'd like to think frank yeah that there's a way out and i've done i've been in management corporate management for years too and of course you give people a way out and it's the chinese thing you give people an exit strategy even if they were wrong yeah but this has doubled down so heavily in the past month or two that it's just getting very hard to to have an exit because if anyone says what you say now like professor moynan in, in your minute is getting louder and louder about this they just get attacked and drowned out it's like double down or die but, but it's what's amazing is the vast majority, no it's the vast majority of the our people shouting these people down you know they're just regular people shouting somebody with an alternative perspective Dan. that appears to be what's happening and within the political ranks you have boyd barrett there is getting up asking for level five lockdown like yesterday 
and you're looking at them thinking, what is wrong with you? I mean, they obviously have no understanding of anything I've talked about today, not in the slightest do they have any understanding of the data, the mathematics, the virology, the epidemiology, the immunology. They have not a clue, but they're going all screaming on the national television for level five lockdowns that will destroy their, their voters, their businesses, and will bankrupt the country and will cause more terrible hardship and, and de delayed cancer diagnosis. I have oncologists and cosmetic surgeons telling me, Ivor, we're seeing secondary melanomas we haven't seen in our career. And that's because there's six months gone by where people who would have normally got dealt with at an early stage are now presenting with, with weird stuff. That's the tip of the iceberg. This whole mm. is crazy, uh, Frank. I mean, I, look, we'll have to see what happens. The winter is going to have a rise in viral illness. We've got hyper-testing. You're going to find SARS-CoV-2 on a lot of people with issues. The thing we must look at in the winter is, is there excessive all-cause mortality in the winter season over prior years? Mm. Is there excessive respiratory mortality over prior years? And no sign is suggesting that there will be whatsoever. And if there's not, they cannot credit the measures they're taking because they are tiger horn deceits. And we know that from the published science. That's it. I wish that they would stop doubling down and and take a rational proportional like the Great Barrington Declaration, go to gbdeclaration.org. You'll see all the professors named on the front, whatever about the signatories. There's around 20 or 30 top professors and a Nobel Prize winner just on the front page. These guys know what I've told you is the reality. Yeah. I, I mean, I think you can... You can um... You can go and find out for yourself, though. You can go onto the CSO and just look at the data. Yeah. And, you know, you might include my link. A few days ago, some slides I showed you today. There's yeah. more in there. I have a 30-minute YouTube, which goes through all the Irish data and the Sweden. And basically, and it also shows the ICU rates up to October 10th, the hospitalization rates in Ireland, the admittance and discharge, the trends, and explains all about what we might expect to see in the winter. So, I mean, anyone who is interested in this conversation and what we did show can go to a half hour, which is all the data, and it's aimed at lay people. And yeah, I actually shared it. Interestingly, I shared it on my um, personal oh. page, and then on my other Facebook page, it just didn't go, go out at all. You really need to put a couple of cats kissing at the start of the video, then there's ah. a much better chance of it going out there. But what I'll do is I'll pin it in the first comment, that video and your channel. And um, I mean, the reality is there's nothing in this for, me, for you apart from abuse. Oh, yeah, but I'm, I'm a corporate guy. I'm 30 years. I'm also highly ethical. If I see something wrong in science or in natural justice or a threat to the future of our democracy and freedoms, I have five children. So I always tell people I have two big drivers. The biggest driver is I have five children and I'm interested in their future and I'm focused on the next generation. I'm going to die. I'm going to get older and die. We all are. That's just life. Um, I'm focused on the next generation, mainly. So that's my big driver. And my second driver is truth and science. I have always fought for the technical truth to be known because since I was very young, it's hard to describe. I've got this glitch. I hate when the technical truth is misrepresented. I can't handle it when the technical truth is abused. That's my principle. So those two things together drive me. And I don't care what abuse I get. I just don't care. The reason is because I'm principled. And it's arrogant to say that, but that's the truth. Respect. That was excellent. Hi, if you like the conversation that I just had and you'd like more, please hit the subscribe button. Thank you.
Um, 